Brilliant. All right, let's get into it. So I'm now in the document the from last week, which is the identifying and anal analyzing a text's big ideas. Uh, so I'm actually scrolled down onto page six of that because I wanted to go through this analytical framework for identifying and analyzing big ideas. Hi, Imogen, welcome. You haven't missed much, just a little bit of um, explaining what we're doing today. Uh, so yeah, we're on page six of the big ideas literary analysis in 10 steps document, which was last week's reading, but I just wanted to discuss it and then apply it to today's text, which is Arthur Miller's drama, The Crucible. The Crucible is actually a HSC text at the moment. It's on the common module uh, for human experiences. So I will touch on that a little bit. Is anybody studying The Crucible at school or have, have has anyone ever studied it before or is it new to everybody? No one has anybody heard heard of the or know anything about the Salem witch trials? Yeah, I heard of them before. Yeah. Oh, we've got another one. Okay, so it's not completely foreign to you, but I'll I'll explain I'll explain the best I can anyway. Um, we've got one more person coming in. Um, okay, let's get into this analytical framework. So I just wanted to go through this idea, touch on again the difference between themes and big ideas uh, and particularly framing this around the crucible and, and some of the themes that are in the crucible, like in the opening scene that we will be looking at, uh, we see themes emerging, you know, deception, manipulation, uh, reputation, self-preservation. They're some of the key themes that we see um, coming through. Um, and then, but we do still see a lot of those themes, we can take them, you know, one or two steps further to develop more complex big ideas, which is the idea of this step two in the literary analysis process. So let's just take a look at this analytical framework in more detail. Um, in, also, in case anyone didn't get a chance to read this last week. But what we want to do is we have identified some of those themes. And then now we want to think about them through the lens of, okay, well, these five different elements here, the author's purpose. So what message is the author trying to convey through the text? Consider the author's motivations and intentions and overarching goals in writing the text and analyse how the author's purpose shapes the narrative themes and characters in the text. So that's really important in taking a theme, the next step, to um, making it a more complex idea. And then we also obviously as well, step two here, intended messages. So, okay, it's not enough to just say, yes, this text is about this. Okay, but why? And a question that I like to ask myself when I'm trying to get to the heart of a more complex idea is, okay, this is the idea being presented, but for what purpose? Why is the author presenting this? Um, you know, what is their intended message? What do they want us as the audience to take away from it? Um, so you can ask yourself some of these questions as well. What key ideas or messages do they want to, us to take away? Identify cent central messages or lessons. What lessons are there for us here as an audience um, or insights? Um, and then you can also look at what's recurring in the text as well, because sometimes if they're sort of hitting us over the head with something going, hey, pay attention to this, I'm going to keep re reinforcing this idea or this symbol, then that's probably also an idea that they want you to dig a little bit deeper into as well. Intended audience is another big one particularly for the texts that we have looked at, and that's intentional. The texts that I have chosen for the first three weeks are a little bit political in nature. They are all forms of political protest. Um, they have very specific um, intended audiences in mind. When the author sat down to write the work, um, they were thinking of addressing, you know, particular people. Um, so that's really important as well when we're thinking about for what purpose, why are they writing this text? Um, and obviously context, what is their context? What's their, as we spoke about in week one, what is their historical, social, what are the cultural factors that influence the author's writing and the text's reception? Um, what is the broader context? So for somebody like 
um, Arthur Miller, he was writing in the 1950s in a political context. The political and social context are really important for the Crucible because he's writing during the McCarthy era. era. So McCarthyism, a political movement driven by um, McCarthy, um, who was a politician at the time. The Red Scare uh, is another big factor. During the 1950s, the American populace was conditioned by these these uh, politicians to fear communism and to fear the threat of Russia. It was written um, around that Cold War era. So that, um, you know, huge tensions between Russia and the US um, at the time as well. So all those factors come into play when we're thinking about why did uh, Arthur Miller write a play about the, you know, Salem witch trials happening in the 1600s, how is that relevant to 1950? Well, he draws some pretty crucial parallels between what the the judges and, you know, the way the court operated in Salem. Um, and you say, oh, someone's just got their audio unmuted. It, any questions? All good? No worries. Um, yeah, it draws parallels between those two. So we see that it's the context is the 1950s, but he's also alluding to that historical context of Salem as well. And we'll talk through that as we analyze the text. And then another key aspect of digging deeper into the complexities of the ideas, uh, what are the values? Um, you know, what values is the author seeking to uphold and what are they rejecting? So we did touch on this a little bit um, last week, but this is another big focus for um, the big idea that I would like to explore today. So the big idea idea, um, I've, I've written it down here, I think it sort of boils down to the human capacity to manipulate um, an for an individual's capacity to manipulate their identity and behaviour to meet their own personal agendas. And so we will see when we're reading the extract from today, we're introduced to Reverend Paris, who's a really important character, and one of the protagonists, um, a villainess, really, Abigail Williams. So um, what we see in both of their characters, and Miller does a really great job of establishing their characters and their you know, really quite flawed motivations from the outset of the play. Um, we see just how much their desire for protecting their own reputation and for self-preservation and, you know, Salem at the time was a, a Puritan uh, society. And so people were really, you know, living in a very strict religious and, and you know, morally um, righteous environment. So, you know, if you had any kind of, um, associations with the devil or anything that fell outside of that, you know, rigid, the rigid social norms of the time, then you could be very easily punished, excluded, ostracized. And then in the case of the Salem witch trials, um, classified as a witch and hanged. So, you know, the consequences for going against the grain in that society, in that Salem 19, um, sorry, 1600s context, um, you know, were really, really severe. And so, you know, it, and that sort of mirrors as well what was happening in, in Miller's 1950s era where um, the House of Un-American Activities, which was this board put together by the McCarthy government, actually was classifying people as communists, well-known people, high profile people saying you're a communist and you're going to be punished and you're going to be persecuted and imprisoned. And that actually happened to Arthur Miller himself as well. So it's a very much a vehicle, this play for political protest. And he, you know, he's really pointing the finger quite acutely at those responsible for, you know, perpetuating, creating this like hysteria, paranoia, a climate of, um, you know, where people like dog eat dog, where, you know, nobody was really safe. And that's what we really see in, in the crucible as well. So if we're thinking about this big idea of that human capacity to manipulate their identity or their public facade, we see, um, you know, and we unpack it through the lens of these five elements, then we can take those themes of deception, manipulation, um, reputation um, a step further to then, you know, think about how does this all interweave with, you know, what Miller's trying to do here through this play and what he wants us to take away. Um, so that's just sort of what I want you to think about now, like take this big ideas idea and the, and the focus idea for this lesson and the extract and we'll have a goal of unpacking it a little bit further. 
So I want to also introduce you to uh, any questions on that before I move on at all? Just a little introduction to the big ideas and, and the play and the context. All good. Brilliant. So now I'm in the literary analysis in 10 steps textual form. This is this week's reading task. Um, you don't need to, it, it's big, <laughs> it's bigger than the last two, um, but there's a lot you can unpack in this. And I've actually been quite explicit with the different aspects of textual form. Um, so yeah, this week, textual form, I've put in here, you'll see I'm introducing what textual form is, the different, you know, why is it so important? Have a read through that um, because the form is important. If we're looking at the crucible, for example, we've got, uh, it's a drama, obviously. You'll notice that the first text was a poem. The second one was a novel extract. Now we're onto a drama. I just sort of want to take us through next week. We'll do a speech, um, take us through different textual forms so that we can also, as we're analysing, get a feel for the different conventions of each textual form. Um, so I've got the, yeah, why is it so important? And then the different, um, where are we? Okay. Key conventions of different textual forms. So you will also see that I've provided a breakdown of the different types of textual forms in this and what to pay attention to. So when it comes to structure, um, the text type. So we've got for this one, it's a drama. Yes. For the crucible, it's also a political satire. That's a part of the form. And it's also an allegory. So these are part, these are aspects of the textual form that you can analyze as well. And that are really important to your analysis. Um, and then I've also provided some, um, a breakdown of the conventions of some really common uh, textual forms. So I haven't done all of them because that could be, you know, an, a novel in itself. Um, but I've got the conventions of poetry in here. Um, I've got the conventions of drama. So this might be really relevant for you for this, this week. <clears throat> I've also put in, uh, coming back to here, you'll, you'll notice for the conventions of drama for the crucible, dialogue, characterization, um, plot, and stage directions. So we're going to today focus on the characters, the stage directions, um, and dialogue as the three conventions that are probably most significant in the opening scene and establishing the key characters and ideas for the focus question. Um, and then I've also provided rhetoric, which is speech, which will be relevant for next week, the rhetorical triangle, if you haven't studied that before, um, and then I think I did film as well in here. Oh, there we go. We've got prose. Um, prose is just a, a very flexible style of writing that we see in a lot of different forms. So uh, it's not so much a text type as like a novel or a film, but we'll, we see there's, there are conventions to prose and it does pop up in lots of different um, types of texts. Like you might see it in prose is often in short stories. It's in novels, novellas. Um, and it's a really common, even in, you'll see um, sometimes in plays, um, even Arthur Miller in some parts of it writes in prose in the exposition at the beginning of the play. Um, so it pops up, even if it's not through the whole text, you'll see aspects of prose and those conventions coming into different texts. And then film, novel and then film. So yeah, feel free to have a read through that. Also, just feel free to have this there as a resource for you to dip in and out of. So if you're analysing a text down the track and you're thinking, okay, what's the form? Why is it so significant? Then you know you can come back to this resource and go to the particular textual form um, that's relevant to the text you're analysing and just sort of there might be something in here that might help to strengthen your analysis of the form. Okay, so that's any questions on anything relating to that so far? Again, we'll we'll deepen our discussion of textual form as well over this lesson when I'm talking about the crucible and then when we discuss the speech next week. Um, no questions? All good. Okay, so let's get into the extract for today. Uh, so here it is. You'll find that in the um, your resources in Podia. Um, so under in the document, Arthur Miller's The Crucible, Act 1, Extract. So I will just do my best to read. My voice is croaky today. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, apologies if it's sort of cracking a bit, but I'll do my best. Um, okay, so this, this 
extract follows the ex there's a long lengthy exposition which is like a an explanation of um, a description of of the era and Salem um, and the climate of hysteria um, that that precedes this extract. So I chose a section from the opening act um, where the dialogue kicks in. So we see a little bit of sort of stage direction at the at the beginning, and stage directions you will notice are very strong strong in this. Um, generally, I've tried to go through this as best I can and italicize because sometimes there's the stage directions because sometimes the stage directions will just appear um, in the middle of dialogue. So I can already see where I've missed one. But anyway, I'll go back and edit the document later. Uh, but yeah, let, let's get reading. Uh, so Reverend Paris is praying now. And though we cannot hear his words, a sense of con his confusion hangs about him. He mumbles, then seems about to weep. Then he weeps, then prays again, but his daughter does not stir on the bed. The door opens and his Negro slave enters. Tichaba is in her forties. Paris brought her with him from Barbados, where he spent some years as a merchant before entering the ministry. She enters as one does who can no longer bear to be barred from the sight of her beloved, but she is also very frightened because her slave sense has warned her that, as always, trouble in this house eventually lands on her back. Tichaba, already taking a step backward. My Betty, be hearty soon. Paris, out of here. Tichaba backing to the door. My Betty, not going to die, not go and die. Paris, scrambling to his feet in a fury out of my sight. She is gone. That's stage direction. Out of my, he is overcome with sobs. He clamps his teeth against them and closes the door and leans against it, exhausted. Oh my God, God help me. Quaking with fear, mumbling to himself through his sobs, he goes to the bed and gently takes Betty's hand. Betty child, dear child, will you wake? Will you open up your eyes? Betty, little one, he is bending to kneel again when his niece, Abigail Williams, 17, enters, a strikingly beautiful girl, an orphan with an endless capacity for dissembling. Now she's all worry and apprehension and propriety. Abigail, uncle, he looks at her. Susanna Walcott's here from Dr. Griggs. Oh, let her come, let her come. Abigail, leaning out the door to call Susanna, who is down the hall a few steps. Come in, Susanna. Susanna Walcott, a little younger than Abigail, a nervous, hurried girl enters. Paris, eagerly, what does the doctor say, child? Susanna craning around Paris to get a look at Betty. He bid me come and tell you, Reverend Sir, that he cannot discover no medicine for it in his books. Paris, then he must search on. Susanna, I, sir. He have been searching his books since he left you, sir, but he bid me tell you that you might look to unnatural things for the cause of it. Paris, his eyes going wide. No, no, there will be no unnatural cause here. Tell him I have sent for Reverend Hale of Beverly and Mr. Hale will surely confirm that. Let him look to medicine and put out all thought of unnatural causes here. There be none. Susanna, I, sir, he bid me tell you. She turns to go. Abigail, speak nothing of it in the village, Susanna. Paris, go directly home and speak nothing of unnatural causes. Susanna, I, sir, I pray for her. She goes out. Abigail, uncle, the rumour of witchcraft is all about. I think you'd best go down and deny it yourself. The parlour's packed with people, sir. I'll sit with her. Paris, pressed, turns on her. And what will I sh say to them? What shall I say to them? That my daughter and my niece I discovered dancing like heathen in the forest? Abigail, uncle, we did dance. Let you tell them I confessed it. And I'll be whipped if I must be. But they're speaking of witchcraft. Betty's not witched. Paris. Abigail, I cannot go before the congregation when I know you have not opened with me. What did you do with her in the forest? Abigail. We did dance, uncle. And when you leapt out of the bush so suddenly, Betty was frightened and then she fainted. And there's the whole of it. Paris. Child, sit you down. Abigail, quavering as she sits. I would not hurt. I would never hurt Betty. I love her dearly. Paris, now look, you child, your punishment will come in its time. But if you trafficked with spirits in the forest, I must know it now, for surely my enemies will, and they will ruin me with it. Abigail, but we never conjured spirits. Paris, then why can she not move since midnight? This child is desperate. 
Abigail lowers her eyes. It must come out. My enemies will bring it out. Let me know what you have done there, Abigail. Do you understand that I have many enemies? I have heard of it, uncle. There is a faction that is sworn to drive me from my pulpit. Do you understand that? I think so, sir. Now then, in the midst of such disruption, my own household is discovered to be the very centre of some obscene practice. Abominations are done in the forest. It was sport, uncle. Paris, pointing at Betty, you call this sport? She lowers her eyes. He pleads, Abigail, if you know something that may help the doctor, for God's sake, tell it to me. She is silent. I saw Tichaba waving her arms over the fire when I came, came on you. Why was she doing that? And I heard a screeching and gibbering coming from her mouth. She was swaying like a dumb beast over that fire. She always sings her Barbados songs and we dance. I cannot blink what I saw, Abigail, for my enemies will not blink it. I saw a dress lying on the grass. Abigail innocently, a dress? Paris, it is very hard to say. I, a dress. And I thought I saw someone naked running through the trees. Abigail in terror. No one was naked. You mistake yourself, uncle. Paris with anger. I saw it. He moves from her, then resolved. Now tell me true, Ab now tell me true Abigail, and I pray you feel the weight of truth upon you. For now my ministry is at stake. My ministry and perhaps your cousin's life. Whatever abomination you have done, give me all of it now, for I dare not be taken unaware when I go before them down there. There is nothing more, I swear it, uncle. Paris studies her, then nods, half convinced. Abigail, I have sought here three long years to bend these stiff-necked people to me, and now, just when some good respect is rising for me in the parish, you compromise my very character. I have given you a home, child. I have put clothes upon your back. Now give me upright answer. Your name in the town, it is entirely white, is it not? Abigail, with an edge of resentment. Why, I am sure it is, sir. There be no blush about my name. Paris, to the point. Abigail, is there any other cause that you have told, cause than you have told me for your being discharged from Goody Proctor's service? I have heard it said, and I tell you as I heard it, that she comes so rarely to the church this year, for she will not sit so close to something soiled. What signified that remark? Abigail, she hates me, uncle. She must, for I would not be her slave. It's a bitter woman, a lying, cold, snivelling woman, and I will not work for such a woman. Paris, she may be, and yet it has troubled me that you are now seven months out of their house, and in all this time, no other family has ever called for your service. They want slaves, not such as I. Then let them send to Barbados for that. I will not black my face for any of them. With ill-concealed resentment at him. Do you begrudge my bed, uncle? No, no. Abigail in a temper. My name is good in the village. I will not have it said my name is soiled. Goody Proctor is a gossiping liar. Okay, there's our extracts for today. So I'm, I'm not an actress, so... <laughs> I can't really do voices and all the rest of it to make it more interesting for you. But um, okay, let's have a little, I just want to get your impression. So any words that pop to mind when we think of either of these characters? So how does Miller construct their characters in this opening scene? Who is Abigail? Who is Paris? What are their motivations? What are they concerned about? Who are they as people? Um, what does this scene reveal about that? Any any thoughts on how they are characterised here? And just feel free. You can put it in the chat if you like. Just to your initial off-the-cuff conversational impressions, you can either verbalise it or you can put it in the comments, up to you. Are these likeable characters? Dislikable characters, honourable, dishonourable. Do they have integrity? Do they lack integrity? You can be right or wrong. Oh, I can see something in the chat there. Brilliant. Paris is a man desperate to retain his position, regardless of whether he has to put his family under the bus or not. Yeah, exactly. He is intensely desperate to maintain his 
public reputation. He says, you know, I've spent three years trying to bend these stiff-necked people, you know, to my will, to my agenda, um, you know, and you're going to compromise that, um, you know, and he's pleading, please don't jump to witchcraft. Um, there's nothing unnatural here. It's just an illness. Um, do not speak of dancing and witchcraft because he knows that as the reverend, um, you know, as the minister of the parish in a very, you know, Puritan society, um, you know, if there's any presence of witchcraft under his roof, um, you know, then that will affect his identity, his public reputation. So he's very desperate to uphold that. So already, already we see, um, you know, a character being constructed by Miller here, uh, who is very much willing to compromise truth and integrity and his family, as Michael's pointed out here. Any other ideas? What about Abigail? What do we learn about her in this? Do we do we feel sorry for her here? Do we get the sense that she's telling the truth? Um, I'll just give you a little, fill you in a little bit here that um, when Paris towards the end there was alluding to um, her being released from her work with in the household of the Proctors. So there's Elizabeth Proctor and John Proctor, who is another key protagonist in the Crucible. So he and Abigail are rumoured to have, at this point, to have had an affair. Um, and then she was, Abigail was discharged from the service. Um, and so in a Puritan society where moral purity is really highly prized um, to commit adultery, um, under the roof of your employer and with your employer um, was obviously a, a huge sin. Uh, and so Abigail is doing everything in her power to repress that truth. And it comes out later that it is true. We see the relationship um, between Abigail and John Proctor um, in, in raw detail. There's um, When we're thinking about setting and symbolism in the play, um, there's a lot that happens be between in private spaces are contrasted with behaviours in public spaces. So the way that people behave like Paris and Abigail here behind closed doors, they're having a conversation that they would dare not have out in public in, in Salem, in the town, in the village. Um, and then when, later in the play, when we see in court, um, you know, people are presenting, particularly Abigail, presenting a very, very different facade, um, very, very different public persona. So throughout the play, and, and we're seeing this already, um, you know, this preoccupation with, um, you know, trying to protect your reputation. Um, okay, so Abigail, let's let's just go from the top here, um, and I will, I'll just jump across to the focus question. So we've got that fresh in our mind. Um, I'll do that first. So, um, cause we can keep sort of coming back to it. The focus question for the body paragraph structure for this lesson and this text is how does Miller use dramatic conventions to establish key ideas and characters in the play's opening scene? Um, so remember when I was talking about the dramatic conventions, when we were looking at textual form earlier, um, I think we can definitely focus on um, the stage directions, the dialogue and the characterization, the way these characters are set up through the dialogue, as well as the symbols as well. So we'll, we'll look at those when we're analyzing. Um, so let's come across to the 10 step analysis process. I think we've already sort of touched on some of these things. So, and I've put some content um, you shall see in, uh, let me move it over here so you'll you'll notice oh don't worry about it actually it'll make me click on too many buttons um da -da -da -da, this one yeah um there's a lot of content is what I was going to show you in your lesson mod in your lesson portal for this about the purpose the audience the values which I've already sort of touched on so what I would like to do is just start unpacking and I'm just going to put the big idea in for this one um, the big idea for this opening scene is the human capacity. I'm going to make that a bit bigger because that text is quite small. Um, to manipulate um, their identity and behaviour um, 
pursue their own agendas. Uh, so any ideas on what the big, what the key messages, given his context, values, audience, purpose, what might some of the messages that he wants to send around this big idea? Any ideas? We've got, I'll just put the themes that I had in there before. Themes introduced in this opening scene. We've got deception, we've got manipulation, we've got reputation. Um, you can also have um, public versus private personas. Oh, you can see something. In How selfish people can be when they are put under pressure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the and it's not lost on me that this play is called The Crucible. A crucible is um, used to dissolve and melt and mix chemicals. Um, and so, and it, and it, and it was used by, by witches as well, but a crucible is, um, you know, one of those, um, it's a symbol of putting in all of these different elements and seeing what comes out of it. And so Miller is saying, you know, sending a very clear message that, um, you know, the tragic outcomes of the Salem witch trials and of um, McCarthyism, where people were excluded, ostracised, their lives and careers were ruined, their uh, relationships were ruined as a result of um, the actions of the, you know, of being labelled as a communist in the 1950s. And in the Salem witch trials, the consequences for being labelled as a witch were, um, you know, death. Um, and so here we have um, Miller sending a clear message that it's this just didn't happen by accident. This was the product of the um, a, a mixture of all of these different elements. And so this is why this text is such such a powerful one for the human experiences module for year twelve, is because um, it gives us such a complex study of human motivations and behaviors and identities and the way that people behave in different situations. So this idea of, um, you know, considering um, how people, oh, I cannot type when I go to do this, I think, because I'm think thinking a few steps ahead, um, how people behave when they are put under pressure. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, we, we definitely see here how people will behave when their lives and identities are under threat. Um, and, you know, we see what the consequences will be. You know, Reverend Paris is very paranoid and hysterical about the potential of people finding out that there was witchcraft going on, um, you know, with people that were under his roof. Um, and so let's have a little bit of a think then about how this connects to the textual form. So I just said earlier that um, the crucible... is a political satire and it's an allegory. So an allegory is when we use, um, you know, a different setting or context or story um, to reflect another story. George Orwell did that in Animal Farm, um, you know, when he's, his um, story about a bunch of animals living on a farm and the the pigs, um, you know, they, they, they're spouting about equality and how you know they overthrow the the humans of the farm and then now the the animals are going to have the run of the farm and you know they're going to live in a way that um you know creates equality and nobody's going to be overworked um you know the animals are free now because um the humans are gone and but what we see it's you know Orwell satirizing um you know the Stalinist Russia and communism through the lens of, uh, you know, an, an animal fable. And it's an allegory for the way that, you know, power corrupts absolutely is one of the quotes from, you know, from the novel. And it's this idea that, you know, the pigs before long are in the place of the humans. And if there is any opportunity for someone to assume authority, then they will. And that's sort of what happens in human societies and animal societies, apparently. Um, but so we see, yeah, allegories used as a form of political protest, really. 
Um, uh, I'll just put a powerful form of political protest. Oh, <laughs> my typing is shocking on here. Okay, there we go. Okay, so if we're connecting the big ideas to the form, um, you know, then we can think about the way that these um, particular ideas, how, how does Miller use um, things like the conventions of political satire um, and um, allegory to reveal this idea here? So we can look at um, political satire when people are being satirical. Any ideas of you know what what are the what does what happens in a political satire? What is satire? Um, often we're um, criticizing can be quite biting and direct. Criticizing or ridiculing a particular um, political movement or ideology or political structure. So clearly we know what, um, you know, Miller was heavily critical of McCarthyism and the fear um, and hysteria propagated by the Red Scare um, and an allegory, the Salem witch trials, heavily parallels the fear, hysteria, paranoia, um, and hypocrisy in Miller's own, Miller's 1950s era. Um, so we can look at how that starts to happen in the opening parts of the play, but these are just the good things that, are, you know, your topic sentence can bring in this big idea, um, you know, this purposeful, you know, for what purpose. You're taking a theme and you're taking it a step further, um, you know, why, and also the you can take this a bit further as well by asking, um, you know, why does Miller communicate this idea? You can build that into your big idea as well, if you like. Um, okay, and then textual form, it's conventions of drama are really important here. And as I said, we're going to be looking at stage directions everywhere, the dialogue, a lot of heated dialogue in that, characterization, um, dramatic irony comes into it as well, big time, and symbols, symbolism. They're the ones that we'll look at today. Okay, um, don't worry too much about the language style and the voice of the text for now. I just want to go down and look at the other ones. So if we're thinking about the language style in a drama, you can look at the way that um, that Miller moves between different styles and registers depending on who's speaking. So the, the tone of the dialogue will change. Um, you know, you'll notice that um, in private settings, people will use different style of language, you know, hushed tones, um, you know, or they, you know, Abigail is far more vindictive and spiteful and assertive and dominant in private settings. And then when she's in public, she's very, you know, innocent and pure and meek and mild. And, um, you know, she she sort of plays dumb, um, plays, plays ignorant. Um, and so that changes the way that her changes the, the tone and style of her language. Um, we see the authoritative tone in um, the way that the um, judges speak, Danforth and Hale in later scenes, you know, they, the people of the court speak with authority and um, in a lot of ways they speak in quite a um, condescending tone um, to those that they sort of see as beneath them, particularly Danforth, um, who's the sort of um, archetypal um, you know, authority figure. He sort of embodies the authority of the court um, and that, you know, black and white logic of the court as well that comes in, in later scenes. Um, the voice of the text as well, you'll notice that there's um, various voices start to emerge. Um, and so you can think about the way that there's, there's the voice that comes through in the stage directions of, you know, this sort of omniscient 
um, you know, person observing the scene that can see, you know, is injecting, interjecting, um, you know, what the characters are feeling. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, emotive words that come in in the stage directions that shape the voice of the text as well. Um, you know, so there's a lot of uh, emotive voices. Um, you know, you'll see in terror or in anger or cautiously or, you know, he struggles to speak. Um, and so you can look at the way that those stage directions shape the voices as well, the way that um, we read the dialogue that follows um, because we've just read the stage direction and that changes the way that the voice comes through. Um, when, you know, when an actor speaks, they would take a lot of direction, obviously, from those stage directions in a play like The Crucible. But we'll leave those for now because I really want to dig into some of these things here. Um, so layers of symbolism, the dialogue. Um, I'm going to pop here, voice of the text. Um, so dialogue, we will break down. I just said we'll, we'll leave the language style a little bit, but dialogue will pop there, um, how those voices are constructed, layers of symbolism. We will, um, something that you can look at are the symbol, the colour um, symbolism. So where white equals purity, um, you know, black and blush they talk about equals, um, you know, a tarnished reputation. Um, we can look at, and also the symbols of symbolic settings as well. Um, private and public spaces. It's not so much in this opening scene. I don't know if they mention any windows and doors, but windows and doors are a huge symbol in this play as well. Um, because that's the boundary between private and public. So between behind windows and behind doors, people behave in one way. On the other side, um, then they behave in... So they're different identities based on which side of the window or the door they're on. Um, so that's another potent symbol. And we've also, also got the symbolism of the title of the play as um, we connected um, Michael's analysis to before. Symbolism of the title, a crucible as a melting pot of various complexities of individual behaviours, identities and motivations. Um, and yeah, we'll come back to imagery as well and a little bit of repetition and contrast definitely because we have the contrast between um, public and private um, and we'll look at a few other forms of contrast too as we are analyzing so let's go back and we can come across and fill in some of this or feel free to have this document open while I'm analyzing so then you can sort of um, do your own analysis if I talk about any repetition feel free to pop it in under number nine any contrast feel free to pop it in under number 10 so you can use this document as I'm analyzing the um, if you open it up, download it, whatever you need to do to take your notes and to start to piece together your analysis, because I'm going to go through and do a bit of a, a point by point analysis before we move on to the body paragraph structure. Um, okay, so the thing I'm just going to point out a few key things that I think you can analyze. Um, so for me, I think um, the things that I find really striking about this, um, some of the key quotes that you could talk about in your body paragraph and that you could analyze in that 10-step um, analysis, um, particularly as it moves on, I'm going to move down to um, this, this quote here, Paris, his eyes going wide, the stage direction there, we see his um, you know, his, his desperation, there'd be no unnatural cause here. Um, and then he repeats that later as well, put out all thought of unnatural causes. So you have that repetition of the unnatural cause here. And Paris repeats phrases when he's feeling desperate as well. There's another instance I'll point out down below where he keeps my ministry, my ministry. And we see that he's really worried about losing, um, the respect of his ministry and, and the people in it. Um, and then here, go directly home and speak nothing of unnatural causes. Again, he's he's really preoccupied with this idea that he's going to be um, pinned for having publicly pinned for having um, you know the supernatural presences in his house. And 
both uh, we see instances in this where if we're talking about the construction of the voices where Paris and Abigail speak here in very high modality tone, they speak with a lot of conviction and they use um, imperative language. So speak nothing of it in the village, Susanna. So to she's speaking to another girl here um, and Abigail becomes very controlling and manipulative of the other girls in the village um, as the play progresses. There's a copy of the full text as well if you want to look at any later scenes in the in the resources on Podia. Um, and then, but when she's speaking to Abigail, she sort of submits to his authority, um, which might also speak to the sort of patriarchal male dominated nature of the Puritan society as well. And then Paris uses a lot of that imperative language with Tichaba. And then when he's talking to the girls and when he's talking to Abigail as well. So we definitely see him as an authority figure, but later we see the way he uses language in the court. Um, he submits to the authority of the judges. Um, so we sort of see a hierarchy based based on how they're using, how different, how these characters are using this sort of imperative, assertive, dominant style language with certain people and not with others. So that's the way Miller creates this social hierarchy and makes it clear through the dialogue as well um, and, and the stage directions. Um, another thing that I just want to point out as well is that in um, Salem, and we see it here with Paris's reactions to, um, you know, dancing like heathen in the forest and, you know, someone running around naked, um, you know, in Tichaba, there's a really, you know, quite demeaning derogatory, um, I'll just pull it down to here, yeah, here where he's talking about Tichaba as well, um, I saw Tichaba waving her arms over the fire when I came on you. Why was she doing that? And I heard a screeching and gibbering coming from her mouth. She was swaying like a dumb beast over that fire. Um, and so Tichaba is a character that represents the other, you know, something foreign, something different, um, and something to be excluded and condemned by the people of Puritan Salem because they have such this, this rigid theocracy with, you know, such strict social norms. Anything that deviates from that um, needs to be silenced, pushed away um, and, and held at arm's length. So we see here that Tichaber is definitely being othered by, um, by Paris here. And there's this fear of the unknown um, that comes through in the way that Paris talks about and with such anxiety and desperation about this idea that, you know, they were doing some kind of witchcraft in the forest and, and what does that mean? And there's this threat of something supernatural intruding into, um, you know, that, that rigid theocratic structure of Salem as well, um, you know, and so Paris as the church minister, it's his job to protect the sanctity, you know, the integrity of the Puritan doctrines and, and the religious ideologies. And, and he, he's being associated with, with witchcraft. So that's, you know, he doesn't want that. Um, so you can analyze some of those could pop up if you're analyzing um, the body paragraph for the body paragraph structure as well in your analysis document. Um, we definitely see a few other instances here of his desperation as well, um, scrambling to his feet in a fury out of my sight, the way he treats Tichaba. But I wanted to point out this um, it, when we're first introduced to Abigail Williams. Um, I'm going to go over time like usual. Feel free to leave <laughs> if you need to, but feel free to stick around. I'll just keep going for a little while. Um, and then, yeah, but yeah, so you don't have to stick around if you've got somewhere to be. Um, Abigail Williams, 17, enters a strikingly beautiful girl, an orphan with an endless capacity for dissembling. Um, and now, now she's all worry and apprehension and propriety. This is a really packed, loaded uh, description here. So she's 17, she's young, she's youthful. Is she innocent? We don't know. Uh, we find out she's not really. Um, a strikingly beautiful girl, which becomes significant as the play progresses because we see that she's willing to use her physical appearance as a way to manipulate others and potentially get what she wants as well. Um, with an endless capacity for dissembling, that just means manipulating and for deceit, um, for you know constructing her identity as she sees fit and as suits her own agenda. Um, and here, though, she's all worry and apprehension and propriety, which is, you know, she's quite, um, she's putting her best foot forward because she's been caught doing something really that's by Puritan standards, you know, illegal and demonic, really. 
associated with the devil and, and witches. Um, and so here she's trying to put forward a, a facade that, you know, no, I'm innocent. No, we weren't. It was nothing, you know. No, 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 no. Uh, she's, you know, she's quite frantically trying to protect herself as this scene unfolds. Um, so there's some good quotes here if we're looking at the construction of character um, whilst also weaving in those ideas of manipulation and deceit and that ability to, um, you know, alter your behaviour or identity um, based on who you're talking to and whether you're behind closed doors or not. Um, that becomes, you know, really, um, that that becomes more important as the play unfolds too. But Miller's really quickly establishing that right from the outset when Abigail's first first mentioned here. So that's a really important quote as well. I'll just point out another couple of important quotes and then I'll explain the body paragraph structure for this lesson. Um, I will skip that part. He mentions unnatural again here, unnatural things, Susanna, there'd be no unnatural cause. Oh no, that's the same one as before. I'm going to skip that page. Um, there's a lot of content here. I've broken down every quote, every into little every passage as well in the notes. So if you want to um, analyze anything in particular, feel free to go and have a look at the notes on that section. Um, yeah, here, Abigail, do you understand that I have many enemies? There is a faction that is sworn to drive me from my pulpit. Do you understand that? Um, now then, in the midst of such disruption, my own household is discovered to be the very centre of some obscene practice. Abominations are done in the forest. Uh, so these you can these rhetorical questions here, where Paris, in his, through his dialogue, is really showing both his position in the in the town, where even though he is a figure of authority his authority is sort of tenuous. It's not assured to him. He has to work really hard to maintain it, um, to maintain his social standing. And we get the sense that he already has put in a lot of effort to get to where he is. Um, and so he can sort of see that that could be taken away from him, stripped from him as well. So those um, rhetorical questions there you could analyse um, and his preoccupation with his enemies. Um, it's another aspect of the crucible as well is that the... And, and McCarthy's society, McCarthyism, uh, where, you know, there's all these unresolved grievances or problems um, that people have in their past relationships. And then, you know, all you need to do to resolve your, um, you know, deep-seated hatred for somebody is to call them a witch and then you can sort of bump them off. And so there's a lot of that going on we see when in, in the next, um, the, the scene that follows, I wish we had more time to study that when Thomas Putnam comes in because he's this sort of prominent figure in the town and he, um, you know, has a lot of grievances and, and he it's his intention to throw Paris under the bus. Um, so an interesting dynamic emerges there where we go, okay, Paris isn't uh, paranoid. This is actually happening and it's happening already. Um, Thomas Putnam is trying to convince Paris to just admit, admit there's witchcraft going on here. Um, we know it is. And Paris is saying, no, no. So this, um, you know, hysteria kind of starts to intensify as well, even after this initial scene. Um, and then I just want to come down to finally these stage directions here. It is very hard to say in terror with anger. Um, you can analyse those if you like. This is where he repeats, my ministry is at stake, my ministry. Um, we see that desperation here. And then down the bottom, I like this quote here too. Three long years to bend these stiff-necked people to me. Um, he doesn't seem to have much respect for the people of his parish there. Um, you know, behind closed doors, he also, we see that he sees them um, in a in a derogatory light, he sort of sees them as though he's better. They're just they're just people to be manipulated um, into thinking that he's a decent person. So they're sort of you know pawns in his own um, social game. Um, the last thing I wanted to point out, yes, here it is. So we've got when he asks her, he's the symbolism of the white. Is it entirely white? Um, the symbolism of you know is white is a symbol of moral purity here um you know are you morally pure abigail and this is where we start to see her moral ambiguity emerge where we don't know 
is she a moral figure or is she not? Um, and she's defending it. There be no blush about my name. Blush is like a crimson. Crimson and blush and red are associated with adultery in literature as well. Um, so, you know, in her saying that, she's saying, no, 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 I'm innocent. I'm, you know, I I this, I am I am white still. Um, Paris to the point, um, you know, why why were you discharged? And there's this word here. Um, you know, she will not sit so close to something soiled. So soiled, you know, has these, it's a, these connotations of, um, you know, dirtiness, um, tainted, um, you know, and this idea that, you know, if you did commit adultery, you committed a sin, then you were um, seen as, as soiled or morally tainted in this society as well. Um, and then here we see as well, if you want to analyse the development of Abigail's character, I mean, we do find out later that she did commit adultery with um, Goody Proctor's husband. So Goody Proctor has every right to treat her with coldness, um, you know, but Abigail's response is she hates me, uncle. Um, you know, she didn't want, I, I would not be her slave. She's bitter. She's sniveling. Um, you know, she's self-defensive. She's defending herself and she's pointing the finger at somebody else. Um, you know, she's blameless. Um, and she has this habit of doing that throughout the play where if she feels like she's going to come under fire, then she'll deflect and she'll find someone else to point the finger at. Um, you know, she'll find someone else to label as a witch and to throw under the bus, um, using Michael's term, which which happens a lot in this play. Um, and so, yeah, we, we learn a lot about both of their characters in this opening scene. Um, and we also, like, like Michael said as well, um, we see what happens when people are put under pressure. And that's where the idea of integrity comes into it too. And as John Proctor's um, character arc evolves, we see that no matter how much pressure, even though he's he's morally transgressed and he committed adultery with Abigail, mm -hmm. he's very remorseful. She tries to keep pursuing the relationship and he's, no, 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 I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm committed to my wife now. And so we see him as morally flawed, definitely, but he's not morally bankrupt like Abigail. Um, so we also see that, um, you know, through his character arc that, you know, he's somebody that can withstand the fire because a crucible as well is a is a symbol where you put the chemicals in and then you light, you heat it. And then it changes the chemical makeup. And so, you know, what happens when you put people in situations where they're under fire, um, it brings out all of these consequences. It brings out all of these different behaviours and motivations. And, and we see, you know, people in all these different lights that we might not have seen them in if, um, hang on, no worries, Imogen, see you later. Um, you know, if they if they weren't put in that situation. So, yeah, I thought that was an interesting one to leave it with. We see that my name is good in the village. She's a gossiping liar. You know, I will not have it said my name is soiled. Um, she will defend herself to the hilt. And that's really established really quickly in this play. Um, okay, so that's there are some of the key things that you could talk about in your 10-step analysis. Um, and then in your body paragraph structure, like last week and the week before, I've given you some examples here um, for your topic sentence um, and for your discussion um, of, you know, the McCarthy era. And there's lots of resources in the notes as well. Um, and then we also, um, oh, it's only 3.33. Okay. That's okay. My, um, the clock on my laptop says 3.39, but my phone says 3.33. So we're not ridiculously over time. That's why I was like panicking that, um, you know, that I'm keeping keeping you guys for longer than need be. Um, okay. Um, I use guys in a, in a gender neutral way, by the way. Uh, I would probably refer to my cats as, and my horses as guys as well. <laughs> okay. And then I've got some examples here of the teals. There, so I've just given the example of the color white as a symbol of purity and innocence, um, symbolism, they're foreshadowing. So you can have a read through that as an example of a teal that you could put together. That's okay. See you later. I'm wrapping up now anyway. And then, yep, yeah, same thing as last week. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay. So yeah, that's, that's the lesson for this week. So um, see what you can do with this opening extract. Um, have a go doing the 10 step analysis process. Feel free to dip into all those resources where I've broken down the extract in lots of detail. And also, as I was saying to Michael earlier, if you're behind in the lessons um, and you still want to put together a body paragraph structure for any of the weeks, um, feel free to do that um, at any time and just let me know, hey, I've done my body paragraph structure and I've shared it in the shared, the shared um, Google Doc for this week, for that week. Um, you'll notice in the, I've got one now for lesson one, two, and three, a shared Google Doc where you can submit your responses if you want feedback at any time. I can't see students peer, I like the idea of peer feedback, but in reality, um, people don't, students don't usually get on board with it, but I've offered it as an option in case, but generally you'll just be getting feedback from me and more likely than not um, other students, unless they've also uploaded their work, probably won't even see it. Um, so yeah, you can make a new page, copy your um, response in, let me know if it's not for that week, like say we're in week six and you go, hey, I've just done my week two response. Let me know because uh, I might forget to go back and look in it thinking, oh, we've moved on. But I'll do my best to check um, to check back on those documents intermittently. Um, now, any questions? I know there's a lot to take in, but any questions on these activities or the play or anything we touched on, anything you would like me to clarify further? Any comments you'd like to make? Any contributions? All good. If you've got if anything pops up, also feel free to email me or put it in the forum. <laughs>